All right. Um, well, this is actually the cover of our very first book published in 2018, and it represents our thinking on the architecture of restaurants. And in this book, we have 23 restaurants featured that are all very different. In, in all, it includes 58 restaurants and some of our ideas about art within these hospitality spaces. So a little bit about our firm. The firm's name is Bentel and Bentel Architects. It was founded by uh, Maria and Fred Bentel, both architects. They met at MIT and they founded the firm in 1957. And as you can see to the right, the firm has done numerous types of work, buildings as well as interiors. The second generation partners are Peter Bentel, myself and my husband, Paul Bentel. And when we came into the firm, we were working on community type buildings that my in-laws had already uh, been doing and had a strong uh, connection to library architecture and churches. And so we started out, we cut our teeth on those buildings. These are actually buildings from our generation, a library in Beth Page that looks aeronautical because we were using the tax money from Roman in a sense uh, in creating this library. And then that's uh, one of the churches that we did, which ended up very nicely on Michael Crosby's, uh, the cover of his book about church architecture. And so that's how we started. But libraries started to um, downsize in the digital age. They weren't looking for more space. They were looking at how to uh, put in more digital material. And then churches also waned because uh, Americans started going less to church and other issues that were happening. So just by luck, we ended up in the hospitality world. And I'll explain that. But we had to wrap our heads around this. Here we were doing community buildings, buildings that generally last a long time, a church or a library. And suddenly we were doing a lot of interiors and we were working on restaurants. Initially, we then got into a lot of hotel work as well. But we started to think about this, that why can't a restaurant be an institution? Why can't it also anchor a community as many do? And one such example would be Philip Johnson's Four Seasons in the Seagram's building that did last a long time and was very much an anchor. So this all happened because a contractor that was working on one of our house designs was also working for Danny Meyer on his apartment. And Danny was looking for uh, an architect to fix his one restaurant, Union Square Cafe. And so we went into Union Square Cafe. He needed some things modified and fixed, but not redesigned. We sat in the front window and he said, well, why would I hire an uh, an architect who does libraries and churches. And my brother-in-law, Peter Bentel, my partner, one of my partners said, well, we can make them really quiet, just like the churches and libraries that we did before, which was an issue with restaurants. If you go in, you can really lose a star or, or get knocked down in uh, the press if your restaurant is really too loud. So we went on to do a number of restaurants for Danny. Danny, course is the um, you know known for Shake Shack which we did not do but we were doing some very special restaurants for him uh, in all about 10 projects including a commissary that they that they use for their catering arm so we started out doing Gramercy Tavern and this gives you an idea about Danny's thinking on this this was really the first big full restaurant that we did for him but he was thinking about a tavern he was looking at restaurants as different types and here we learned a lot we learned that uh, there's a casual part up front this is something we often do where there is a casual area there's a bar, a bar a curved bar because it's a little bit more um, hospitable. You can turn around and talk to uh, someone who came with you or someone you're meeting a little bit more easily than a straight bar. The fine dining was in the back and this was the first time we ever did a private dining room. 
Um, it has great streetscape that's really important from an interior's point of view. You really need to see how your restaurant looks from the outside because the kind of glass that's in the window, the way the lighting is, colors and art can really push out to the sidewalk and to the even the, the cars driving by that give some PR to the restaurant and even let people know that it's open. How often do you go by a restaurant thinking it's closed and that's because the lighting inside is not properly done. We went on to do 11 Madison Park and we did two restaurants back to back actually. On the other side of this wall, there was Tabla, an Indian inspired restaurant. And they opened up just two months apart. It was about 20,000 square feet total. This was the bigger of the two. And this was in a landmark space. So we had to be very careful about certain details. Uh, for example, we couldn't put lights into the ceiling. So we needed lights. So we added these hoops and those all light each table. If you look closely, the side of the table is dark. The top of the table is lit because in our restaurants, every table has a light above it. In this case, we uh, did a pri uh, more private area to the right-hand side, which you see, um, if you could see my cursor, this uh, image to the right top is a uh, a smaller dining area and we studied Madison Park, which is outside and have pictures of the entire park that ring this room and give it a sense of its context. 11 Madison Park, the, the motif for the, their, um, the, the title and being a park, we studied actually all the leaf forms, which you can see in the millwork here as well. Um, on the floor, there was no floor here, it was a concrete floor. And you might look at this and say, wow, that sort of art deco figuring is something that was there, but it was not. That's something we put in. We also lifted uh, the back space because we, when we do restaurants, we try not to have a sea of tables, which is a, uh, not a good thing to be said of your design. A sea of tables makes you think of a cafeteria. And we try to do things without creating boxes, but to differentiate from spaces uh, within a space. And so in this case, we raised people up in the back so they felt like they were in their own community. And we use that word community a lot. We also have a handicap wrap to the right, which you can't see so people could graciously get up to that back area. On the bottom right, you see um, the bar and that ceiling was something we put in. Again, this was a very raw space. The only thing that was here was the, the ceiling details and the lights and the marble way in, in the back. We did win um, an IIDA uh, award for this. It was the best of show, so it got the top award. And in 2017, it became the top restaurant in the world. And when they judged restaurants for such an honor, they do include the decor as part of the judging. So when we won that big award from IIDA, they told us that it would uh, change our world. It really didn't, the phones didn't really uh, start ringing, but what it did do was gave us the opportunity to compete to do the restaurant at Mo the modern restaurant. And Danny Meyer was also competing to be the restaurant tour for the restaurant. So we weren't, we were being hired because we did win the job directly by MoMA. And here you're looking at the entry and you're looking at a space that um, I'm sitting in, in my background. Now, you might wonder, how did we do the modern after doing something like Gramercy Tavern and 11 Madison Park? Well, Danny wanted to have a tavern and 11 Madison Park was actually a brasserie. But in our case, we were all raised on modernism. Peter and Paul were raised obviously under our founders, Maria uh, and Fred Bentel, who designed this house, which is on stilts um, very near to our office in Locust Valley, New York. And it's a modern house. And the curvature of the, the roof forms actually mimic 
an apple orchard that's in the foreground. It's um, dying out. It's a hundred year old apple orchard, but the forms come from that. So they were raised under Fred Maria, who studied under Alto at MIT. Gropius was down the street at Harvard. And I actually worked at Gropius's firm called the Architects Collaborative. Gropius was no longer alive, but several of his partners were. And so I was also taught about modernism in a very direct way. So when we got the possibility to do a project like the modern restaurant at MoMA, we actually had that background much more so than doing something like Gramercy Tavern. This is the interior of the modern. And this one picture will tell you a lot about how we attack a project. We, this is in an existing building. It was the former uh, first museum for MoMA, but at that point it was called the Modern. So the restaurant then adopted that as its name. But as you can see by this photo, that we, we try to define things with planes. We try to define things with ceiling planes most of all because you actually see a ceiling much more strongly than you see a floor. The floor also is defined. We put in a sprung oak floor, which is what was being put into all the galleries that uh, Yosho Taniguchi was doing at the same time. And he also used a dark black terrazzo, which we brought in to kind of knit this restaurant back into the museum, trying very hard not to create a box inside a building to put the restaurant in. And to our surprise, we won our first James Beard Award for restaurant design in 2006. So that in itself really did change our lives um, much more than winning the IIDA Award because suddenly we were introduced to other restaurateurs and chefs and they were starting to call us to do projects. So now that we were kind of knee deep in restaurants, which was a fortunate thing. We had to really think about this and we really started taking it on as a research project. So how do we how do we deal with this new challenge? How does one create a restaurant? It's a very special type of interior. We took it on really as a serious research project. We wanted to create lasting institutions like I talked about before as in a church or a library, why can't a restaurant be a lasting institution? And we studied older restaurants in Europe and beyond. And our findings were that we needed to create communities without making closed boxes. So you can see this is a plan of Gramercy Tavern. And we tried very hard to, every one of those blue boxes was a community and tried to create an entity in that realm that then uh, bled into the other rooms, but they still had their own ident identity. We never put more than three tables across in a space. And we learned that in Italy, this is um, uh, to the left is Rouge Tomat and we have 11 Madison Park on the right. And I'll talk about uh, these further, but you can see in Rouge Tomat on the left that we had rows of three tables. Once you put in a fourth table, it feels like a cafeteria. So we had tables that were near the, the organic kitchen. We had tables against the wall at the top and then the round tables go into in the middle because you're really facing other people and having a grand time and a big party. And we even separated those by smaller pieces of millwork because it makes people feel like they have a certain amount of privacy yet you still need the energy of the room. But we learned this really from Italy where spaces for restaurants weren't really that wide. They often had tables on the, on the two walls and tables down the middle. And so that taught us this concept. So we use ceilings a lot and furniture as space defining elements, not walls. And we also believe that you can, you should never have a bad seat in the house. So you may be trying to stuff chairs and tables into a space if there's one that is too close to the bathroom or too close to the entry door and you don't have a vestibule and people are getting cold, they're never gonna come back. So just get rid of it and, and just tell your client that's all the seats that will fit. This is Laburna Den. 
always use authentic materials. This is something that we learned from our, uh, my in-laws that uh, when new materials come out, you get excited. You think, oh, I'm going to go try that material. I remember when Corian came out and I price granite versus Corian. The granite costs the same and is much more authentic and also very durable. If it gets nicked, it's still granite underneath. So they age gracefully. And it's really in, in our work, that is what we do. Also, light is something that is so important to hospitality design. It makes people look good. It makes your materials look good. It could also make people look bad if you put it in the wrong spot. So you have to be very careful about lighting. Lighting from the bottom is a really nice thing to do, as you see in the top image. And I'll show you some other lighting tricks that we've used uh, in some of these spaces. And as I said before, light every table. It's almost like having a little campfire at every table. And make signature art central to define space. We use art in all of our work. We are strongly against hanging a picture on a wall. <laughs> we like making the whole wall the art. In this case, this is the modern at MoMA and it, it is a huge photograph by Thomas DeMond, it is behind glass and behind it are the bathrooms. So we use it as a way to hide things. In this case, this middle room, the central casual dining space doesn't have a window. So many people don't even realize that because this is such a big window. Um, you can't always use every kind of art in a, in a dining environment. Imagine getting wine spilled on or splashed on some really famous piece of artwork. This is encased in glass, but it's also a photo of an installation that Thomas DeMond did with paper, which then got destroyed. And the negative was the art, which could be printed numerous times. We, um, uh, so again, just going back, it, it can help make a window. We often use greens and blues for that very reason. And it also creates a memory for the restaurant and people see this and they know where this place is. So what else did we learn? What are the other ingredients? Clients, their concept, because they come uh, to you with other ideas. An empty building, of course, architects and designers, us, and an interpretation of hospitality in all facets of design. We learned a lot about hospitality from Danny Meyer, but we think we add our own take on hospitality because we're not standing there shaking someone's hand and smiling and saying, welcome. We have to make sure that everything we put into the space welcomes people. And so even the way the chair is tilted, the height of the chair, we, we've done a lot of the furniture in these spaces as well. So that's very hospitable. So let's review an example. This is Rouge, Rouge Tomat Chelsea. We had the owner who was from Brussels, the chef, Somalier, and they had their own concept about health through food. So they came up with this idea that they wanted to take a building that was basically falling down and also bring it into good health. This was uh, two carriage houses in, Chelsea that were in terrible uh, disrepair. The floors were falling in. Um, it didn't have an elevator, which you need if you have anything on the second floor that you don't have on the first floor. And so you needed designers, that was us. And then our own interpretation of what hospitality is. And this is the after uh, photos uh, where we really brought this building back to life. And you, there you can see the exterior and the interior, which we will study a little bit more. So just going back to this group, they had a restaurant in Brussels, which I went to go see their first one. And they wanted to bring the idea to New York. So the first Rouge Tomat was on East 60th Street. And that's something we call the tomato tower that you're looking at there, trying to actually hide some mechanical equipment that was behind it. Um, you entered into the space facing a maitre d' stand and some uh, warm, uh, actually sound absorbing panels. Uh, the floor did not exist. It was a concrete floor when we went in. It was originally a dress shop and 
there was a lot of walnut around the space, which the client didn't like. So we, he loved white oak. So all the things that you see in white oak are things that we added to the space. Here is the overall space from the entry door. We did win a number of awards on this. So this was a really uh, happy project for us. We added everything you see here, except for the walnut. We redid the column cladding and we designed all the, most of the furniture. Here's a plan of the space. When you enter in, there's a juice bar to your left. They were big on anything healthy. They really were the greenest restaurant at that time in New York City. And we added a lounge in front of the bar, which is tough to do because you don't necessarily want people seated at a bar with their backs to you. If you have an open bar seat, it's not very nice. And then have a lounge very, very close to them. In this case, we were able to mix bar, lounge, dining, which included eating. And the way we did that was we created tables that looked like lounge tables, but they go over your thighs. So that actually entices people to spend money, and buy food and eat. And then we had booths on the right side. It was a huge restaurant opened up in 2008, two days after the economic crash and really did suffer a lot because of that, because big restaurants were the thing at that moment and then they declined very quickly after the crash. We also took the dressing rooms in the back of this former dress shop and turned them into some of the best areas to dine in the space. Here you see those. There was a, a stair leading down to an even bigger space. The dressing rooms became these two boxes where people really fought to, to be able to dine in those areas. And down below, we knew people would not want to dine near a stair. It's not a favorite place. So bringing the rouge tomate idea to the United States, we looked into what fruit or vegetable was red that they wouldn't have in Brussels. And of course that's the cranberry. So we created our own little cranberry bog here. Uh, in which we shoved two dining areas, again, two very special places to dine in what would have been the worst area to dine in. We created a walnut room where we actually took end grain walnut block and put it on the, the wall and sort of playing up the idea that they didn't like walnut, but it created a very nice private dining room found some light fixtures that we turned sideways and put those on the ceiling and had a live edge table. So it created a, a room people really did love. And here you see to the left, a number of tables that are on the ground floor and the open kitchen that I'll show you a little bit more of. So this is the open kitchen. This client actually asked for um, a kitchen that was based on the golden section. Never had anybody asked me to do that or even, I didn't even know clients knew that, but it was, it was great because I am kind of into geometry and it was a fun thing to do. And the, and we also were able to put a cleanable wood ceiling into the kitchen, but in the end it was really a mistake because uh, the, the chef, God love him. He, um, called me up and he said, Carol, my broccoli looks purple because of the yellow ceiling. So can you do something? So I had to add some more lights in because it did affect the food that they were working on underneath it. Um, these are some of the details where we're a firm that I think is known pretty much for really fine detailing. We do pride ourselves on that. And so these are just some of the mill work. And the bathrooms tell a lot about a restaurant. At MoMA, when we did the bathrooms, we weren't even asked to do bathrooms at the modern restaurant at MoMA, but we said that's not hospitable to ask people to go into the museum to go and to use the bathrooms. And so we were able to get some very nice bathrooms in at MoMA. They were communal, that hit the New York Times, <laughs> uh, maybe not in a good way initially because it was kind of a shock to people back when we did that, but it's pretty common now and it definitely has been common in Europe and other places. This is, these are the Rouge Tomate bathrooms and I found a type of wood veneer that has little holes in it, probably caused by worms, but it's quite beautiful. So we encased it in glass 
and that's your entry into this communal bathrooms. It's very nice to have your own bathroom if you can have if you have the space for it, and, or to make the doors of bathrooms go all the way down to the floor, uh, leaving just very little space above or below on the door. And when you went into these bathrooms, the light turned on another glass panel with this wood veneer in it. If you can see in the middle image, there was kind of a nice surprise for people when they entered the bathroom. So have fun with the bathrooms. In this case, you can see the walnut floor going in, but then we found a porcelain floor that was very close in color to the walnut that we could put in so it could be very cleanable. So I'm gonna show you a little movie here. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Okay. Is there sound with this? It will in a minute. It's always fun to create a restaurant. Leaving this place is bittersweet. Um, it was a great time. We had a lot of memories to work in a beautiful space, but it's the next chapter for us. I'm Carol Ventel. I'm a partner at Ventel & Ventel Architects. We're working on a new space. It's a beautiful historic carriage house on West 18th Street, the new space. It's a landmark building, and so there's a lot of work ahead of us. It's a, it's de a definite challenge. It's not as easy as it looks. When you look into the space, it's basically two long rectangular spaces. Now it's a garage for a roofing company and we're turning it into a restaurant. It's important to show the clients the materials. This is amazing. This is exactly what they want. Simple one. That's another simple one. Part of the floor in the bar room we think we're going to leave as a stone. So this time we're going toward a metal bar top. This is part of the paint colors. This is now we're gonna make a new painting and now we've got some new items to throw in to the work. It's much more difficult to create a wonderful, warm environment walking under the constraint of the landmark. This building was landmark and under the constraint to keep the most we could, instead of going, destroying everything and rebuild a new space. And I have to say that Bentel, one, one more time, totally outperformed, and especially Caron, uh, Carol Bentel uh, and Raf made a wonderful job and their entire team was super nice. And I just, I'm just feeling full of gratitude for what they, they achieved here, it just, it's just amazing. If you look at all the details, you look at the, the painting on the wall, it's exactly like if you just make a journey in the history and you just enter a horse table where a nice, very cutting edge kitchen has been installed in the back and some lighting to magnificent all this space, magnify this space, yes. Um, so here we are, here we go. <laughs> You still feel a bit of ownership, even though you don't own it, because you've sweated over it, and you, you know how some of those pieces of wood came to, to be a table, and, and you remember what stain color it was before, or uh, if it had been a renovated piece. Carving up the space from these two former garages that were former carriage houses, we brought it back to the way it was. That's back. Even though you might not dine at Rouge Tomat, the whole community is now better because Rouge Tomat is there and the building has been cleaned up. It's really delightful to see on the street. It's got really good bones. It's beautiful architecture. 
So it does speak to a time in the past and yet it functions for a time in the present. And I think that that's a gift that by the whole group, the owner deciding that he really wanted that building and was going to make every effort for us to restore it gave a really nice building back to the community in, a, in better shape. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I'm gonna get, still walk us through some of these spaces. So that's Rouge Tremont Chelsea, the second Rouge Tremont. And here's a floor plan of what you just saw, a uh, repeat of some of the other images. But one side, the top part was the, the bar and with a, a very special wine room. And then the other side was the restaurant side. And then we did have private dining room and bathrooms upstairs. This is the entry. Um, a problem with the first Rouge Tremont was that it was in a landmark district and we couldn't add a vestibule to the building. And so the idea of keeping the cold out of the inside was really difficult to do. So in this case, we couldn't add a vestibule either. So we subtracted. I often think of interior design as subtraction and architecture as addition because I do, I do both. I really think when you're given an existing building, if you can afford giving up some space, subtracting space out of a building can enhance the space. And in this case, we had an interior walkway. You can see we had a gate to the left, not an enclosed door. And um, here's Rachel, the manager, walking out of the building. But we had a vestibule even beyond that, which kept people warm on the inside. And then you get this glimpse on the inside as you, you walk toward the entry. Now you're in the space looking back at that vestibule, a high top table, which we used from the former restaurant that was in the Walnut Room. And we designed the chairs that you're seeing right here. We used a lot of metal and leather because of the horse stable. We used the old uh, doors that didn't really function anymore and created new doors. We put um, the upper image is actually Starfire glass, which has less glare than regular glass, so that you could see through from the street, from the car into the space, it costs more than regular glass, but that's the way it goes. And then you can see a lit wine, the wine room beyond the bronze bar. So you can get a glimpse through art at the wine, wine bottles beyond the green. Art that you see in front of the wine room actually came from the former Rouge Tamont. We like to save things and reuse items from job to job if we can do that. And this is the kitchen side. We used a special floor that was uh, green because it tried to keep the tree, the whole tree, and not just slice off the edges and make very rectangular pieces of wood flooring. It, it's a very complicated system, but really lovely to use. And again, we use some of the art from the former Rouge Tremont on the walls and on the ceilings above the open kitchen. And this is upstairs where we had um, required several bathrooms. And I remember moving the doors to the corner. You can be very strategic in where you put doors, something I hate to see anywhere in a restaurant. So when you come up the door to the left here, you come into a vestibule and before that, there would have been a door here for a bathroom, which would have been awful to see. So we were able to sneak that around the corner, use uh, some really beautiful end grain block and created uh, art. And we, we often do the art ourselves. We consider a texture, a, a, a wall with texture on it to be art. And we did some really uh, fun things, I think, in the bathrooms. Again, like MoMA doing something special. And here's the outside of the building that you saw before. And here it is uh, lit at night now with trees installed. Now, just going back to the modern, this is uh, the image of the modern, which is actually tucked in under a Philip Johnson building to the right called the annex. And the original MoMA, which we're also in, is to your left. Here again, we have the ingredients. We had Danny Meyer, the restaurant tour, 
um, Glenn Lowry, the director of the museum, and Ron Lauder, the um, one of the trustees and also a donor, and Gal Gabrielle Kreuther, who was the chef at that time. You see a model of the modern uh, building, uh, and then you see the at the top, and then the Philip Johnson annex went where that darker building is to the right, which was formerly a townhouse. You see the plan below. We were put into three parts of three different buildings for this restaurant. One in the, the original museum in Philip Johnson's annex, and then in the new Taniguchi section to the back of all this. This is a, some uh, an article, Metropolis did a large article on our design, which we're quite thankful for. And here you can see in the plan where the, the right side, if you can see my cursor with the green, that's where the kitchen is. And the wall that separates the kitchen from the dining area is open. And where you see these two, the light green dot, this kitchen serves the fine dining, which is here and has a view of the sculpture garden. The dark green kitchen out this door serves the casual dining. And they had a joint dishwasher in between. There was also private dining, which you see to the upper right. And that had its own little kitchen to the back to handle it. And so the theory behind this is that you might want to come for a birthday. So you're, it's an occasion kind of moment. And so you're gonna go and reserve a spot in fine dining and pay much more money for your dinner. Then you might go to the museum and after seeing some of the art in your blue jeans, decide you just wanna come in and get a drink. Or you might wanna have a casual conversation or bring your kids in. I brought my children quite often to the casual dining area. And then maybe you just want a drink, one to settle in, and we created some low furniture by the Thomas DeMond so you didn't obstruct the view of the Thomas DeMond photo. And so quite often, if you create these different areas, your, your, your space is much more hospitable and will attract patrons to come in for numerous reasons and many times rather than just once a year. So that was very important. And we used our same idea of creating communities again no more than three rows of tables across. You can see the same thing in the, the fine dining or in the casual dining. So we created communities within this space. We also took a play on the dark glass that you see of the Philip Johnson building and the white glass, which is actually an amazing double glass system with glass fibers in between it of the original, uh, the modern building. So. Here you see the space again, and I've highlighted the maitre d' stand. Let me go back to that. Um, the maitre d' stand is the first moment where someone comes into a restaurant and it's so important that you are greeted by that person. In this case, it was a little tough because we had people where you see the Solowit uh, work. And again, another kind of work that can be easily repainted because it's, um, the artwork is really, it's the instructions for the artwork. That's the entry to the restaurant. So here people are coming from the museum on this side and they're walking down this long hallway and we put in a glass wine rack so people could see through and not feel claustrophobic. And we, we really worked very hard to get a street entry that wasn't in the cards initially. And that would mean you'd have to only go to the restaurant when the museum was open or deal with figuring out how to get in when the museum was closed. And so in this case, we didn't want two maitre d' stands because that's very off-putting. We wanted one. So we created the system where you'd walk in on 53rd street and you would get to the maitre d' and you could see that's the sentry to your right, or you come in from the museum on the left side and you also get greeted by the maitre d'. Once you're in, you are, uh, we had people who were walking by this uh, bronze glass wine rack, which you could see through and see people's happy faces who were sitting at the bar. And from the bar side, you saw action and people walking back and forth. We once did a Houston's restaurant up at Faneuil Hall and working with the um, Houston's 
team now called Hillstone. And they said, one thing is really important, never put the bathrooms up by the bar. You wanna see, and excuse me for saying this, asses in motion. They wanted to see people not just easily finding the bathroom, but walking through the space and making some visual activity with people walking through the space. Down below on the right, you can actually see into the kitchen, but you can't hear the kitchen because we created an acoustic, uh, almost like in a theater, little holes are in the stainless steel panels and there's acoustic material behind it. So you can hear a buzz of noise in the restaurant, but you can go back into the kitchen, which is also making noise, but it's a pretty quiet kitchen, but you can't, you can't hear either space um, in the other space. So again, this is an image that you saw before. The fine dining is actually behind glass, frosted glass panels that are behind. Now, just talking about the glass of the two buildings, the way we tried to weave this into to Taniguchi's museum design, we also tried to, to bring the black glass in from the Philip Johnson building, which became bronze glass, and bring the white glass from the modern, original modern building, into the other side of the Philip Johnson building. And we also wrapped it around the bottom of the bar and all of these sinuous glass walls come from that. Here you're by the Thomas DeMann photo, the bathrooms are behind this lower uh, area where you can still dine because the tables do go over your thighs is on um, the left, on the right is the fine dining and they have a marvelous view of the sculpture garden to the right. And this is um, the private dining, which when it's not in service, these are all pivoting doors. So again, try to hide doors, make them into walls, and that's the um, private dining. Upstairs, we did cafe two, and we had uh, to create a system that would allow thousands of people to come in and many of whom didn't speak English. So we had a lot of things that we call wayfinding. We hate signs, so we took this cold walk-in refrigerator and we tore the back off of it. We put a, a glass in the front of it, a uh, low glare glass. And I was in there arranging cheese and prosciutto uh, for a long time to, to make this appealing to people and to make people walk toward it. So when they walked toward it, down below them were the people that would take their order. This was um, fast casual that you would then go to your seat with a little sign and put it on uh, your table. We designed these tables. They were made in Denmark. Um, they were kind of like monastery tables where you might end up sitting next to someone you didn't, you don't know, and you all just had this great experience going to the museum. And so it created a kind of buzz and a real fun place to be to meet other people. But we tried to create a very intuitive system with this. All the stainless steel that you see on the bottom of this, we created all this um, millwork for the food. We had to work very hard not to let food that we wanted to be visible, not let oils come out of it or it spill closer to the uh, glass. And we created an area where, a um, little hard to see, but there's a, an area not where these registers are, but on the right hand here, where people, that's people's head heights when they're seated at the tables and they could actually see themselves in the polished stainless steel then we used a beaded and brushed stainless steel as well. We went on to do North End Grill for USHG, which was Danny Meyer's company. In this case, we, Floyd Cardoz was the chef and he served um, charred fish. So we decided to do charred uh, wood for the walls. This is the uh, entry looking into the bar and you can see way in the distance, the open kitchen was, which was really the major idea here that you could actually dine almost like a diner and look into the kitchen and see what was being cooked. And we had a big piece of wood so that when the food was ready, it was put on the wood, didn't make that terrible sound that you might hear on something harder. And you could actually watch the fish being charred. In this space, it was a, a kind of a dumbbell space where the middle section had a little small neck. And so rather than taking, you know, being upset that this isn't gonna work, it's a bad space to transition from the open uh, kitchen and the bar area, 
to this bigger dining room, we were able to create some fun areas that were part of the service, the, the dessert, the um, wine room, uh, some a, a clam bar and a, a coffee area and the bread as you see here. So you were kind of going through a market which had to be protected by glass. It's very hard, especially nowadays, um, there are is issues of terrorism, believe it or not, with open kitchens that you can't exactly let patrons be able to reach in and do anything to the food product. And this is the big dining room separated by banquettes to create those different communities An open ceiling, but those lights are acoustic. They have little holes in them. And not putting a ceiling in, it depends on how uh, uh, fine dining that you're going to have or it's more casual but you can create an open black ceiling you can put acoustics up there and you could if people see a light in front of it they don't even notice that there's a black ceiling above but you do have to deal with acoustics and we did a private dining room which became very much part of many of the restaurants that we've done and they do uh, they do really bring in a lot of money for the restaurant tour now, La Berna Den was a wonderful project. We were very lucky to get this project. It was um, the best restaurant in New York at that time, still is, I believe. And here are ingredients for Eric Repair, the, the famous chef, Maggie Lacoz, the owner uh, with Eric. She started it with her brother who um, died very early on and Eric became the chef. And then Aldo Som, the master sommelier. The space, uh, you can see to the right, a picture from 1986, which was very dark in character, a lot of small pictures on the walls. They also, you should know, serve mostly and almost only fish. So that is a distinct aspect of this project. And so we did the project that you see to the bottom right. The head maitre d' Ben is ultra important. Um, we're actually doing another project with with Ben right now, and he would stand behind our onyx maitre d' stand and greet everybody. But that's really the face of hospitality. So in this case, the restaurant wasn't huge. Um, it, it is fine dining at its best, and we took the former restaurant and gutted everything except for the ceiling. So they had this coffered ceiling, which uh, they claimed was teak wood. And that makes sense because they serve fish. Teak is a boat wood. So it, it, it connected beautifully to their um, concept. Uh, when we studied it, we think it's really cherry. <laughs> and we the wood that we added to the space, uh, we used cherry wood for that. But Nevertheless, they all look the same. So we created a dining room to the left, which you see in the left photo. And there was a divider where my cursor is to divide the uh, bar and casual dining and lounge on the right. They had a lounge before, but no one sat in it or used it. So in this case now, you can get um, a city harvest meal at a lower cost for lunch without a jacket and a tie in the bar room. And People can't, uh, it, get, it gets filled. And so they're doing very well um, in this new space. We're very worried that they would lose a star because we're doing a couple of things that are not really always part of fine dining, like a banquette. We have this curved banquette here in the back, which they wanted. And the benefit to a banquette is that you can ba uh, gang tables up and create a group of um out of a deuce, you can create a group of four, six, eight, and so forth. So it gives you great flexibility. The other thing is that in this area to the left, we created these small booths, but they're only for two people because we thought we were worried if we had someone in the middle have to scoot out of the booth to go use the bathroom, that that would not be very hospitable. We designed all the furniture that you're looking at here. Um, again, this is the maitre d' stand uh, at the entry we created several different screen walls one was made out of aluminum and it was um, glass beaded on one edge and polished on the other so it gave kind of a shimmering effect we took away a closet on the right that didn't allow you to see out of this window they used to have a closet that covered this whole area and we doubled up the closet area at the entryway um, that you can't see in this but we wanted a system where people 
knew about it, but they couldn't necessarily put their nose up to the window and look into the space. There are a lot of people here that want to be seen. There are also some people who don't want to be seen that come and uh, dine in some fine dining uh, restaurants. And so we uh, designed the rug, which is a combination of the cherry color of the wood and the silver color of these sort of shimmering screens, which also might remind you of reeds in a, in a river where the fish come from. We found some wonderful shelving that is, um, has lighting in it. So we had them pick out all the best liquors to put on, this, on the two sides of the bar. And liquor quite often is amber in color. So it creates a very warm effect. And we created a wine room in the back, which is almost like a submarine where all their wine is stashed back there as well as some upstairs. We did allow one picture to be hung up and that's Maggie's uh, grandfather. He was the fisherman. And so that, that, was allowed to be put over the bar area. And here's more now looking back toward the uh, screen at the entryway and the screen that divided the, the bar lounge area from the dining room. And here's the whole space. We also had a situation at the window wall to the left where everything outside was really quite ugly. And so we found a screen that we lit from below we also had radiators we wanted to hide. So you can see by this photo, you don't see any of that. You still see light from the outside. People can still see silhouettes of people on the inside. So it served two, two purposes. We also redid that coffered ceiling where lights were visible before. We created a lot of slits in order to get light on every table. You can see how it's dark on the edges, but light on the table. And we have a second lighting system in here for Valentine's Day, which in their world stretches for four days. They take all the furniture out and put it in a warehouse, bring back in deuces for Valentine's. And we have a lighting system that hits every single one of those deuce tables. We curate the art almost in all of our work. In this case, uh, Ran Ortner is a realistic uh, water painter. He does amazing work. And so he, was, he had this piece finished and it fit within like six inches of both sides of the space, but it speaks to the fish that they serve. And here you see that window to the right that I said, um, there were some horrid things outside to look at on the sidewalk scape. And in this case, you don't really see it, but you can see outside and people are well lit uh, nicely as well. And these are the two two of the uh, four booths that we created that were really, it's a four top table. We did oval tables. Uh, tables are important to know their size. You have to ask the chef for what kind of dinnerware they're using. You can help with the dinnerware, which we do. And we go with the chef to different places. We bring cardboard <laughs> uh, uh, mock-ups for the tableware to be put onto them because uh, if your tableware and your tables don't work together, it could be a real disaster. We like oval tables because it also pulls people closer to one another and is more intimate. And we won our second James Beard Award for restaurant design in 2012 for La Burner Den. We've actually won three um, total, which is, I don't think too many uh, design firms have done that. I, matter of fact, I'm not sure any have um, for a space that we did at the Whitney. So we also did more for La Bernadette. They wanted to have a uh, space for larger parties, which was across the street. And we wanted it to tie into La Bernadette, but not look like La Bernadette. It was called Privé. And we took several of the ideas and used them on the ceiling. You can see our cherry um, screen now on the ceiling. And so you can see the La Bernadette on the top and then you can see Privé on the bottom and how they relate in color and spirit, but they're not exactly the same. And here's the entry foyer. You come in from inside of a building, come up by the elevator. So we have a screen there with some acoustic material behind the aluminum fins. And then here's the uh, the area for a large party and Eric Repair, we created a, a place to the right where he could actually show off uh, his food and, and also do some um, shows. 
And then underneath all of this, um, they wanted to put a wine bar just for Aldo Sum in his name. And so we were in this space, there was a Solowit above it outside in this outside plaza. And inside, it's very small. We had a limited amount of people that we could put into the space. And Maggie wanted it to be like Aldo's house. So she wanted it to have um, a big couch in it. So we created this U-shaped couch. We created a communal bar. You can see seats at the back of the bar near where Aldo Som would stand. And we had high top tables around the edges. So it created another U all with high tops and then a small private room for wine tastings. And so here you come in, you did have a revolving door, so you kept the wind away, but we also did the screen to kind of make this area feel a little bit more private. There were existing bathrooms. We used the screen again, twice in the back to not let you see the bathroom door opening and closing. They wanted shelving throughout because they wanted us to be like Aldo's home. And there's a clever thing, this lower shelf is actually where the sommeliers leave wine bottles. When people say, I want a glass, I want to try that, they leave the open wine bottle on the shelf so people are enticed to maybe want more. And it's part of this whole shelving system. Now, Aldo uh, is a very uh, uh, lovely, funny uh, guy. He, he's from Austria and we were trying to fill up the shelves with things from his history. And we said, well, Aldo, what do you do? And he said, well, I, I just do wine. And even though he's a big bicyclist, we couldn't get anything out of him to fill up these shelves and we were soon to open. So I basically went to our house and pulled things out of our shelves. And, and, and they're still sitting in those shelves right now. My daughter's um, first violin is up there and my French book from high school is there be, because there's the French connection back to Le Bernardin. And uh, we have sculpture by my children <laughs> that are in the shelves. So sometimes you're faced with that. Some, my, my husband's uh, print is on the wall to the left that I took right off of our wall and it's there to this day. But anyway, we designed the rug and uh, the other pieces of furniture were purchased or we, we did commission that large couch. And here it is uh, with people. We also made sure the back of the couch, you could actually nestle up and, and sit on the back of the couch, maybe talk to someone who's in that inner U-shaped area. And the ceilings were 24 feet tall. We didn't wanna lose that height, but we brought in lights to um, lower the scale of the space, which we often do. And worked with affordable art. I found this artist um, called Catman who makes all these tiny little pieces that didn't cost very much at all. And I got to select my own pieces to kind of go with this space. So we, uh, in almost all of our spaces, again, we curate the art, if not do it ourselves. In this case, Ground Cafe at Yale, we, we did suggest what to do for the art. In this case, Marcel Breuer was the um, architect in 1970. We had engineering students in this very famous engineering school, and they wanted a cafe, which they named Ground Cafe because they're electrical engineering students. And then we had the group from Yale that we uh, worked with. We were adding to a very famous building, and we wanted to do so carefully. So we added this to a brutalist concrete building. Um, we added to the exterior of the building. So we added a lot of warm wood, the walnut that you see to the left. And we also added a big art piece on the wall and ceiling that the students could program. So students from the art campus also use this as do the students from the engineering area and they can go in there and put whatever art they want up digitally. These are the existing walls of the building in concrete behind our new wall with the walnut. And we lit again from the bottom, which is a very kind of sexy way to, to light a wall. And that is actually the cover of our second book, which I'll show you a little later. And here's the um, space from the kitchen side, which was very tiny. Now, Craft Restaurant was another um, restaurant that uh, launched us into doing more restaurants. The head of craft is uh, the famous top chef, Tom Colicchio. 
and we've done almost all of his work. So he started out at Gramercy Tavern when he was the chef for Danny Meyer and then moved on to his own restaurants, many restaurants and even smaller, more casual um, food venues. And so we're, we're still working for him. He's an amazing, amazing person and client. So we started out with Craft Restaurant, which was um, not a large restaurant, was in a very linear storefront space. We created a wall on the left, which we call art, and it's uh, a curved wall with leather uh, leather on it. We started out looking at pig skin, which was really quite gross, and decided not to do that. But the leather wall hides other activities behind it that they need, that the patrons don't need to see. And on the right side, we had a small bar that was underneath a um, very large wine rack. And we also used a sealing material called tectum that you might find in say a public school, but we were able to take a very common material and raise it, um, partly using the same word craft, um, that, that we uh, did things that were very uh, done by hand, that you could see how they were made, very much like the food that Tom was serving. And so these are these, this contrasting of a soft curved wall against a hard glass, wine rack done with little chains and uh, fiber optics in there in order to light the wine. The wine needs to be uh, chilled at certain temperatures. So you have to be very careful about how you add light to wine. And here you just see more images. We designed the tables. The idea behind craft is that you eat family style. So the tables had to be wider in the middle. And we have a little drawer on the edge that the sommelier pulls out in order to uncork the wine. And these banquettes are up against the, the window side. Note that we have a window on the right and there's blue light from outside. We picked uh, an art piece that also had a blue color to it to again, create one of those windows. And almost as if that's another streetscape at the end of this long space and we hid the bathrooms behind. So we did more for Tom. This is River Park in the science area of Manhattan. And in this case, there were scientists above. And so we created an art piece with little scientific symbols that you see in the middle glass area, which is right here. And it's hiding a very large private dining area when they have big conferences. The restaurant is in front here. The um, East River is on this side. We have a bar that's separating a lifted up area in the middle and I'll explain that again, trying to create those communities and the kitchen is way to your right. It was in a much bigger building. So this pink area here is showing you where this all sits. Now just watch the screen for a minute. This is um, closed with this art piece. You can kind of see clouds. The scientific symbols make clouds there. And then it's now opened to that other area. So these big glass panels all move side and the restaurant then opens up to its full capacity. The middle section, because people don't want to sit in the middle, had to really be thought about um, grandly. Like how do we make these people feel special? So again, we created a community. We had a step that lifted you up there. Have to be very careful, careful with steps, um, particularly at bars um, in, a, in a restaurant environment. Um, we also did something where you can see bronze panels on the bar, on the bottom, the die wall of the bar, and also on the ceiling at the window. The window was, the people at the window were facing the East River and we literally got a bronze panel and had a truck run over it to give it this watery kind of appeal because if you put something near the window it reflects what's outside the window in a, in a nice way. And here, here you see that panel above diners who are at the window and you see the East River. We worked on 432 Park, which was one of the skinny towers that shocked people as it went up. There are many more now, but 432 Park um, was a building um, done by Rafael Vignoli and the de developer Harry Macklow, who's always uh, notoriously in the, in the news, just sold one of the biggest art collections um, the other day at Sotheby's. And he was our client. And we worked also with um, Sean Hergat, who was the chef. So there's the tall, skinny building. And we were on the 12th floor, considered the amenity floor 
for this building, which was all made in concrete. It was an amazing construction. So there it is, um, quite some views out of it. This is the interior where people come in. <laughs> Harry wanted something from the Pantheon. So this is actually the same kind of playful floor that you would see in the, the, the uh, Pantheon in Rome. We took the same geometry and we used um, two different kinds of marble. In this case, you have to be very careful with marbles you select because if they don't function for whatever you're having them do, like be a floor, you could be in great trouble. This is the uh, lounge space. We created several different lighting systems that were all made in Prague. These actually, Harry wanted them to move, so they actually come down to the floor. Um, we created a beautiful herringbone uh, wall to the right to complement the, the colors in the rug that also had the Pantheon pattern in them. The ceiling is not really wood. These are Hunter Douglas panels that are really acoustic because but because the ceiling is so far away, no one knows it's not really wood, something uh, really to use. And just like our other projects, we often hide lights in the slits. We hide the mechanical system in the slits, the sprinklers. We don't think people should be seeing those in these spaces. The doors that you do see in this case are to a wine room, which you see now to the right, that you could go in there and also have a private tasting um, in that wine room. And the other side is the dining area, one of my favorite chandeliers. I got the, I was the lucky person to get to go to Prague and see this in production. And so this is a big chandelier defining this space. And then because the ceilings in this case were 23 feet high, we dropped um, a row of uh, crystal balls in order to bring the scale down for people. Now, those are restaurants that are in our book and I'd be, more than happy to send you all a book for your library. These are ones that are not in the book that came after its publication. We did a um, cigar bar in Philadelphia that is very much like a humidor. Uh, and we had, uh, you can see the slits in the ceiling are part of a mechanical system. So when people are smoking cigars, the air gets sucked right out of the space and cleaned um, so that this is a safe place to be uh, smoking cigars, the furniture we did design. That's actually the same chair that we designed for Laverna Den at this bar where we are starting to create more communal spaces at the end of a bar. And we put arms on it so people could put their arm down and likely with a cigar in it. Uh, this is a view from the other side and they actually did have a huge humidor which, which is um, uh, has to have the proper humidity for the cigars. We did a restaurant up in Boston. We've done several up in Boston for Benedetto, picking up the air brick uh, pattern for Tuscan farm and hay barns. And we did a project in a very skinny building up in Boston. You can see it up on the top right. It's only 17 feet wide. It was a really tough project to do, but lots of fun. And then current projects that we've just finished recently at Hudson Yards, we did Hudson Yards Grill. These are the renderings for that project. We worked with the famous Michael LaMonaco of the former Windows on the World restaurant, um, really wonderful person. And this is it in real life. We hope you go visit it. It's a booth restaurant, um, very different than many of our other restaurants, big on art. We have sculpture, which is a tough one to do in restaurants because you're taking up floor space, but sometimes you want a community to be able to identify with a piece of art. Again, making them say, you know, this is my community. I buy that red sculpture or I buy this yellow painting. We also created a huge hood that you see way in the distance that we wanted people to see from the entry. So um, even though the hood is actually stainless steel underneath and it's an open kitchen, the hood is highly lit so that you do see it at a distance. Um, the ceiling hides all the lights, but yet there is a light on every table. If you look at that wood table to the left, it's highly lit, but the edges are not because we have a dedicated light to it coming down on that table. Funny story, we did a model for them and it started drooping during the presentation and we ended up loving it so much because it kind of created an embrace over this one area of the dining room. And uh, we designed 
the lights in this case, and we designed the booths as well. A recent project on Long Island for Young Chef, this is a rendering, it was in a, uh, uh, a building that was very symmetrical and it had two low sides to it. One low side was going to become the bar, but the other low side, we had to find a way to capture it, but that low side is to the left. So we created a ceiling system would, which would come up into this high space, zip around and capture this other lower space. So diners felt like they were part of the bigger dining room. Um, we also, again, had a dedicated light for every table, but lowered lighting again to create that scale, the people scale. So this is an actual photo from the uh, recently finished, it opened up during the pandemic. These are these beautiful uh, ceramic lights that come from that ceiling. And again, you don't see the heating system, you don't see the sprinklers. We also had a bad streetscape. So we put curtains all around this lower area and put wood panels above. And so now this is a very coveted spot because you're not looking at car headlights and, uh, and not a great street. And here we didn't have a lot of space to create um, an area to get to the kitchen, was, which is to your right. So we created higher banquettes here. So this is kind of the service corridor. This is the bar. Um, there is a Moroccan uh, 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 direction with the food. So we got some Moroccan lights and um, created a sinuous bar with a, a communal area at the end for, and it also works out for the handicap. So they have a lovely spot to sit that is at, at the right height. We commissioned uh, all the art pieces that long art piece was totally made for this space with all the colors. And then we did some outside art pieces actually done by third generation Bentel who uh, asked the chef for his spices and she created light towers out in the outdoor dining room that were his spices. I call those the Spice Girls. Um, and then we just uh, opened up a project literally two weeks ago under the City Corps building. We were asked to do a uh, what we call a very large restaurant made out of uh, 17 food venues under the famous U Stubbins designed City Core building known for its angled top and for the columns that are in the mid span. There's a white building under all of that with one of those super columns coming down in it. And so we gutted the whole space. Those are our renderings at the top where we were trying to create something that didn't look corporate because they initially had another designer doing something very corporate. They reached out to us to have something that would be um, less corporate. And so we created a terrazzo pattern that is really like an outside park and curated the art um, with a lighting designer came up with not little tiny backyard lights, but huge globes of lighting at different sizes that um, bring down the scale and are within this space. We curated the art that's actually um, student work that you're looking at there from School of Visual Arts that these are um, a project that I was involved with, with Kevin O'Callaghan, the 3D um, famous set designer, where all the students looked at um, a New York City landmark or skyscraper building and created a dress form um, like it. So you have the Woolworth building here, the Empire State building, uh, and we've it's now uh, an exhibit that you can see in the space. And this is the whole space that exhibit is way up on what you call the through block. We curated the art that you see the, the, the pink flowers to the back. We used an illustrator, um, Yuko uh, Shimizu, who uh, does small art, but then we had a painter blow it up. We wanted a story to get people to go up and down a stair that we had punched into that floor. And we wanted to entice people again, wayfinding, using art to do wayfinding. Now you can also see our crazy terrazzo floor uh, at the bottom of the stadium seating. And we worked with some high school students for the art piece on this upper right. So this is when it's empty right now, it's full of people enjoying food. And we do have a second book coming out. It's on all types of work residential work, hotels, conference centers, and more restaurants. So that will come out in the fall. Um, we hope you'd like to see that. And just to finish up, we do have a third generation. Those are our children, um, the three 
children and then Peter's daughter to the to the right. They're all artists in their own right. Um, there's Michaela with her um, towers that she uh, lights up with solar power. They light up at night. And um, our son Nicholas is in his third year at Columbia in architecture school. So that gives us hope that there is truly a third um, generation, but they're all, and there's Lucas and then again, Antonio. And so um, one project that Michaela just did with a student of mine, uh, Fouad Kazan, did this, um, She, you know that you've seen all of these open air pavilions all over the city. There are thousands of them and many of them are, are I don't know how they prevent COVID because you're quite enclosed um, for the most part and all of them are really brutally ugly and with um, substandard materials. And I know a lot of these restaurants didn't have any money during this time, but we were approached by uh, Paul Greco of the Terror Wine Bar in Tribeca and to create one of these. So this is uh, it in its closed version. This is it in its open version, all made with louvers. And Michaela literally dug shells from uh, a nearby beach to put in the um, barriers that surround this, which you need in case a car might decide to go the wrong way. Uh, it's wine, red wine colored on the inside, which matches the red of his own ceiling of his wine bar that sits on the other side of this. This is the sidewalk side. And here you see people dining also on the side of this. This is now just won a national design award, a state design award and a local design award. Um, so we hope that uh, Michaela keeps working with us. Anyway, thank you all.